Welcome to the video channel of Chapter 154 of the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors. This episode is a program titled Clock and Watchmakers Who Help Build the Modern World, Part 1. You have it. Okay. So I guess we'll get started. So like I said earlier, this is our first um, try at, at Zoom meetings. Obviously, we're not meeting live right now like most organizations. So um, I had a bunch of programs that I did over the last couple of years at, at multiple chapters. And then I, I decided to use this clock and watchmakers who help build the modern world. Um, part one, There's a, this is a two-part series. When I first put the program together, I had 11 people and, and I, all of a sudden I realized there was a lot more um, important people in clock and watchmaking and horology in general that needed to be um, added to the list. So what you're gonna find out, these early clock and watchmakers that date all the way back into the 11th century, they were really the rocket scientists of their day. And they were very, very um, multifaceted. They were involved with a lot of different sciences and, and, and other mechanics and astronomy and so forth. So basically that's what I said here, you know, the, the technological advancements that, that they developed really helped build the modern world as we'll see as we go along with this program. There's the list of the people we'll talk about in part one. And it's a, a fairly impressive list. Starts with Sue Song all the way back in he was born in 1020 and goes all the way up to the modern times of George Daniels. He just died a couple of years ago, and he was basically the greatest horologist of the 20th century. We'll discuss some of the things that he did. And then in part two, here's a list of people that could not be, they couldn't be ignored. People like Thomas Mudge, Robert Hooke, Simon Willard, Seth Thomas, Louis, uh, Louis Cartier. And, and John Harwood and, and, a, and a couple other ones. They, they're very, very important people in history. So I had to turn this into, a, into two parts. <clears throat> so when you, when you look at a, a clockmaker versus a watchmaker, a clockmaker from the 15th to the 17th century was really a, an artisan that, that not just repaired clocks, but made parts and, um, also built precision scientific instruments and whatnot. Today, a clockmaker is mostly a person that services and repairs clocks. They don't really actually design or build missing pieces that often, but you know, once in a while that'll happen. But uh, the typical clockmaker is, is a service and repair person today. Similar to a watchmaker, uh, a watchmaker back in the 16th through the 19th century was really a master craftsman and they built all the parts of the watches by hand. Today, a watchmaker is somebody that just basically services and repairs it with factory made, made spare parts um, because the vast majority of all watches today are factory made. Very few are handmade any longer. And the ones that are handmade cost into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So Su Song, the first person we'll talk about. In history, he's known as the Chinese Renaissance man. And if you ask me of all the research I done, he's the most important and probably the most advanced clockmaker in history. And the reason I say that is because <clears> there <throat> wasn't a lot of prerequisite inventions prior to him. He developed a lot of things on his own. And as we'll see, as we go through history, it's, a, it's basically a, a connections, the connections to connect connections. Somebody just didn't wake up one day and invent a pendulum. There was a lot of inventions prior to that that they they based their their own studies and research on to come up with a, an improvement. So one of the main things that Su Song did was build this huge water clock. It was, it was hundreds of years ahead of its time. And in fact, I don't have it in this um, presentation, but during a war, uh, his province had lost this war and they disassembled this clock and took it back. Years later, they tried to reassemble it. Well, he had died. He got his son and a bunch of other people that worked in his court 
and they could never figure out how to reassemble it. That's how advanced it was. But he was a statesman. He was an astronomer. Or he was a map maker, pharmacologist, a mineralogist, a zoologist. It goes on and on. The, the, accomplish, the accomplishments that he did in his life is, is almost unbelievable. There's a diagram of that clock. It was 30 feet high. It had 133 different clock jacks that were intricate um, pieces of it that, that made different sounds when the hours and half hours chimed. <clears throat> some, some of the things that he achieved, he invented the sprocket, you know, we, we, you know, bicycles, motorcycles, automobiles, track armory vehicles and whatnot. He was a person who actually developed that technology. Um, he created a, a celestial atlas, atlas for astronomy. He was a high-ranking official in the Chinese government, ambassador and president of the Ministry of Personnel, and the Minister of Justice at one time. And then he rose to the post of vice president and chancellor and secretariat. So he was in the court of the emperor. That's how important he was as far as politics go. Um, he compiled one of the greatest horological treatises of all time, all the way back <clears throat> to the Middle Ages. It was written in 1092 and published, I think, in 1094. And he also did a treatise on pharmacology, and um, which in, which included the zoology, botany, and mineralogy as well. Just a just an incredible, incredible person. Um, he actually was the first person that used uh, certain ingredients for for treating drugs and, and digestion systems. You're talking almost a thousand years ago. Next person we'll talk about Peter Heinlein. He was uh, one of the first craftsmen to make small ornamental portable clocks. And he's, all, he's often cited as the inventor of the watch. There really isn't an inventor of the watch. We, we, really, they're, they're, we really don't know exactly who invented the watch because it kind of evolved from the clock. So over a period of 100 to 200 years, all these different inventions came out. But Peter Heinlein was one of the early important people that developed um, different small portable watches and clocks. Comes from Nuremberg, Germany. He um, had this idea of portable timekeeping for a long time. He actually was, was imprisoned in a Franciscan monastery for about 10 years. And during that time, he, he, he worked in these ideas of portable timekeeping. Um, he created the balance spring or main spring, which allowed you know, small timepieces to be invented. And he basically it was a predecessor of the pocket watch. So a lot of people consider him to be the father of the modern clock industry that we that we have today. His first clock was made around 1510, um, and that was a very very complicated piece that wound up being in a uh, um, a castle in in, in Germany. And then he became, he worked his way into uh, real expensive pieces that he sold to royalty and, and, um, and people of the court. He really caused a sensation around Europe with these, with these, with these uh, beautiful clocks that were precision. And the scientific circles considered him to be a near genius. And he also made, of course, scientific instruments as well. Jost Bergy, um, he was an innovative astronomer and a clock and scientific instrument maker. And he had a lot, he had a lot of inventions that, that we take for granted today. He basically invented the crossbeat cross escapement and the remontoir um, and increased the accuracy of mechanical clocks and, and, and basically in, in orders of magnitude. Um, incredible accuracy that he was able to um, get clocks to, to work in basically the end of the 1500s going into the early 1600s. He's also a mathematician and he invented things like the logarithms and uh, certain trigonometric identities. Um, in, in astronomy, he came up with uh, different complicated mechanical models that, that mimic the movement of heavenly bodies the, the gigantic crater on the on the moon called it's called Bigris is named in his honor. 
and then he actually entered he entered the service of the emperor in 1604, and he worked with the famous astronomer Kepler. In horology, like I said, he developed and invented the cross feed escapement. He also was the first person to invent the minute hand. Prior to, to Jost Bergey, all clocks only had one hand. And he actually added the minute hand. And then, of course, the second hands came after that. And, and you know, obviously, that increased the accuracy of, of uh, clocks. And um, a lot of astronomers were able to use, start using clocks now to, uh, to gauge the timing of, of celestial bodies. He invented the remitoire. This is a small secondary source of power. And um, it's, a, it's part of the timekeeping time keeping mechanism that uh, kind of works like a mainspring used in precision clocks. And his inventions really improved the accuracy and allowed the first, uh, first time clocks to be used as scientific instruments. And um, also some of his inventions were, uh, were built into things like the crosshairs of telescopes and whatnot, which really in increased the accuracy of, of astronomical uh, calculations as well. Christian Huygens, um, fa fairly a famous uh, person throughout history, an astronomer, physicist, uh, gambling, problem solving, and he's a horologist who invented the pendulum clock. I think he's probably the coolest looking horologist of all time. If you look at that painting there, uh, I don't think you can get any cooler looking than that. But uh, he also published a lot of uh, studies on mechanics and optics and on games of chance. He would have been a hero in Las Vegas today. Some of the things that he came up with back in the 1600s is unbelievable. In astronomy, he, he also designed different eyepieces for telescopes and enabled the multi-lens eyepiece. He discovered Saturn's moon Titan and if you know anything about astronomy, that's probably the most interesting body in our solar system as far as life and, and um, different molecules and whatnot they're studying today. They're, they're thinking that that's probably going to be the first place they discover life when they, when they get there. He also discovered a bunch of nebulae and double stars. Uh, in optics, he developed the wave theory of light, uh, the principle of secondary wave fronts. And he's also incredible, this is interesting, he's also credited as the inventor of the magic lantern. And this was kind of like the uh, precursor to the movie projector. And then, then his biggest invention as far as horology goes, he invented the pendulum clock. This is dated, the first one's dated to 1657. Um, and he derived, derived a lot of these formulas for mathematical pendulum swings you know, the mass of the rod length and all that. He was the first person that came up with a lot of those uh, mathematical formulas for that. Um, and he also developed the balance spring watch somewhere around the same period as Robert Hooke. And there's this huge debate, historical debate by scientific historians as to who actually did develop the balance spring. Was it Robert Hooke or was it Christian Hygiene's? And based on a lot of the documentation from the time, it's probably never going to be really figured out because it all happened around the same decade. The next guy, Thomas Tompion, uh, he's basically uh, the father of English clockmaking. And if you go over to the uh, different museums in London, uh, the Greenwich uh, um, uh, Museum and whatnot, you'll see some of his pieces there. They're worth millions of dollars today. If, you could, if they ever hit the market. So he, he was a, a developer and builder of a lot of important clocks. He created, this is an interesting another thing about him. He created a numbering system and applied the first serial number system to manufactured goods. Now, I worked in manufacturing for decades and I can't imagine being, being working in a manufacturing environment without having serial numbering an inventory system to determine what's passing through the manufacturing line. He was the first person that, that did that and actually documented that. Um, in, in astronomy, he worked with the Royal Observatory and built these beautiful, uh, sophisticated 
accurate clocks that the astronomers could use for observations. And he was famous for over complex mechanics. And he improved an awful lot of timekeeping mechanisms. And basically it put a new standard of workmanship and quality into timekeeping. He was one of the first watchmakers ever to apply Christian Hygiene's invention uh, of the balance spring into watches. He's credited with inventing the Tompian regulation, which is another escapement that, that uh, created more, uh, more accuracy. Uh, what else did he do? He uh, deadbeat escapement, like a, a early, it's an early form of the deadbeat escapement, and actually introduced pendulum spring suspension for table clocks. And that was about 1680. So in 1680, he was developing pendulum swing suspension from, from the development of a large pendulum in, in a tall case clock all the way down to a tablecloth size. John Harrison, um, he's, he's, you know, everybody knows him basically, even if you're not studying neurology, he solved the longitude problem by inventing the marine phenomenon. And there's a picture of him on the left there. And you know, basically after, they, after he solved the longitude problem, it really, really uh, improved uh, safe mar maritime uh, sailing in the age of sail and exploration where, where they, they kind of knew where they were going. You know, before that, they, they, it was, looking at the stars and whatnot and uh, with very, very inaccurate positioning until John Harrison invented the way to uh, determine longitude. And the way he did that was the, with, with the marine, the handheld marine chronometer. And it was the one that he invented, right there it is on, on the right, and that's called H4. And that's over at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich in London. And I actually took that picture when I was over there a couple years ago, and they still wind that every now and then, but not not that often. It's um, it's in a big guarded uh, area um, behind plexiglass and whatnot. So uh, uh, probably the most um, famous watch in the history of timekeeping. I can't imagine anything ever ever be ever being more famous than, than that piece right there, the H four. Some of the other stuff that he did, he actually invented the temperature compensated pendulum. You know, and uh, we all, if you don't know what that does, it when when weather changes from, from colder to warmer environments, this these rods in a, in a compensated pendulum actually either slow it down or speed it up to, to make it to, uh, maintain accuracy. So uh, an incredible invention on his part. He also invented the grasshopper escapement. Uh, during the time that he's working on the, the longitude problem. And he also invented oil-free bearings. Uh, these are frictionless bearings that need no oiling. Of course, we talked about the marine chronometer, probably the most famous invention in neurology and scientific uh, maritime science of all time. And then when he, if you don't know the story, he, the longitude prize, it took him a long time to get that. And finally, a king of England um, made the parliament give him the money for that. David Rittenhouse is another very interesting, he's, a, he's an American and he was a renowned astronomer and inventor, mathematician, a surveyor, public official, and um, very, very important person in the revolutionary part of the United States. Um, on there to the left is a nice picture of him, painting of him with a, with a, a telescope and one of his famous clocks there to the, to the right. And that's in the National Museum of American History. That was built around 1770. And some of the things that he did uh, in, in astronomy, he was the first person in the United States to build a telescope. He was the first person to record the transit of Venus. And um, he was also the first American ever to sight Uranus. When he was, a, he was a, a very important surveyor, actually finished the Mason-Dixon line and, and actually worked on building the borders of New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania uh, 
during the time of independence in the very beginning of the United States. And he was the first director of the United States Mint, held that position from 1792 to 1795. First person to the man-made diffraction grating. Uh, this is another uh, uh, telescope optical component that um, was used on spectroscopes and things like that. A lot more accuracy into that field. Uh, unbelievable accuracy and, and uh, scientific uh, prowess on his point. He was a very accomplished, complicated clockmaker. He made... Uh, for over 20 years, he worked as a clockmaker up to the revolution, and he had very complicated astronomical clocks and with planetary modeling on them and so forth. And his clocks, if you know anything about them, when they hit the market, they're worth hundreds of thousands of dollars into the billions. I mean, uh, uh, his stuff was worth a lot of money. And it's interesting about him was during the revolution, he was one of the people that went around and they had a group of people going around and they'd come to people's house and they'd take the lead weights of your clock and they'd take them and melt them down and use them for bullets during the revolution. And the funny thing is several of his clocks that survived the revolution still have their original weights in them. So they're not sure. They're not sure if he just kind of ignored his own clocks or not, but you could actually get arrested for not turning lead over to, to the revolutionaries in Pennsylvania and, and New York and New Jersey and those areas. And um, some people would take their weights and bury them out in the yards so and they wouldn't lose them. The next person we can talk about here, uh, one of the most famous European clockmakers of all time, Abraham Louis Breguet. I could talk about him from now to midnight. I mean, it's uh, guy was a pure horological genius as we'll see here. If you don't know much about him, he was incredible. Um, he worked with a lot of European nobility. He was his clientele was was uh, leading public figures and, and nobility and basically the celebrities and the top politicians of the day. Some of his achievements here is it's just it's just hard to believe uh, what what he did. He improved the automatic winding mechanism. He invented the gong for repeater watches, you know, the bells that go off during the repeating mechanism, the Breguet numerals that are that still grace watch hands today. Uh, he, he came up with that. He adopted and improved the lever, lever escapement. Uh, some of that, that technology is still used today. He developed a small watch for the showing of the equation of time, any shock devices, uh, retrograde display mechanisms, uh, the Breguet spiral, which is a spiral flat balance spring with an overcoil. Sympathetic clock, which is basically a master carriage clock design. He invented the music, musical chronometer. Um, the tact watch, basically a precursor to the Braille watch. You could feel it in your pocket and tell what time it was. Uh, he also patented the Turbulon escape right around 1795 the double escape wheel chronometer that needed no oil. Um, he developed one of the first wristwatches that actually worked in 1810 for Caroline Moreau, the Queen of Naples. And if you don't know who she is or she was, that was uh, Napoleon Bonaparte's youngest sister. He invented the carriage clock and basically he invented that for Napoleon so his officers could carry a clock with them and back in the day, they called that an officer's clock. Because this was before wristwatches and portable clocks were really in, in general use. So this small portable officer's clock, what we call a carriage clock today, were actually used out in the field um, in military operations. And a couple of his pieces that came up to market within the last 10 years or so, the, the pocket watch there on the left, that's called a uh, the Brigade 2 Movements. That sold for $4,175,000. The one there on the right, that's called a sympathetic, uh, kind of like a Brigade carriage, carriage clock, sold for $6,800,000 in 2012. 
So that's the type of a, a you know, anything of his original brigade watch or clock that comes up on the market, it is worth millions of dollars. That absolutely unbelievable um, amount of money. Because, you know, his watches and clocks go way beyond horology. They're scientific collectors and, and European, uh, you know, all these clocks were, were owned by European elite, European kings and queens and whatnot. So the provenance of them is very special and the price of them are were very high, obviously. Eli Terry Sr. Uh, introduced mass production to the art of clock making and other American. And he received the United States' first patent for a clock. And he developed uh, this mass production that, that really was an important part of getting the United States up to date in the uh, industrial age, because the United States was behind the eight ball when it came to the industrial revolution. England and France and several other European powers at the time were decades in, in front of the United States as far as the industrial revolution. And Eli Terry proved that mass production can be done in the United States with, with clock production. And that just spread out in the, into the world of manufacturing. So he's really known as the, the father of American mass production in the clock industry, transformed the, the clock making from a time intensive handcraft into a mass production industry. Um, he worked and partnered with Seth Thomas. And he really made mass production feasible and profitable and practical and uh, really led to the mass production techniques used in, in the Industrial Revolution even in, into things like Henry Ford's uh, Model T production and whatnot, all had roots back into Eli Terry's process for ma uh, man mass manufacturing. David Hare, another person that uh, was, was, was really instrumental. Uh, you, don't, you don't hear too much about him in the United States. He was a philanthropist, an Englishman or Scotsman, uh, he moved to India and became a very successful and rich watchmaker. And instead of going back to England and, and spending his money and living high on the hog, he decided to stay in, in India and try to help that country um, evolve into a more uh, um, modern company, a modern country. He teamed up with Ram Mohan Roy, which is known as the father of the Indian Renaissance and helped build several schools and colleges that really helped India get out of the dark ages and move into the more modern world. And we know today they, uh, a lot of the IT industry is uh, in India and all that. And a lot of that has its roots with what David Hare did and basically took his money that he made in watchmaking and, and uh, turned it into a positive um, influence for the, for the whole nation of India. And there you see there on the slide that the School Book Society in 1817, the Calcutta School Society in 1818, saw Hindu colleges and whatnot. He was an instrumental in, in developing. And finally, we'll talk about George Daniels. Um, no doubt about it, the greatest horologist of the 20th century. He invented the coaxial escapement. Uh, like I said, he just died here in 2011. So, uh, you know, he lived into this century, so not too many people like him were working in the field for probably the last 150 years. And what he did was he built he, he built these modern watches, the case, the dial, and even the the, the um, I don't know about the springs, but I know he, he all the gearing and whatnot he did. Um, he also came up with this idea and invention for the coaxial escapement, and that's used in Omega watches today since 1999. And that that was a very uh, very interesting um, invention that he uh, he got patented. And he did, he invented that in 1974, basically, but it really wasn't used in, in uh, production watches until 1999. And 
basically the, the lever escapement was developed in 1769 by Thomas Mudge. And this was a significant advancement over that. But you gotta, but you gotta remember the lever escapement was in practical use and even in today's watches and whatnot. But from, night, from 1769 all the way into the 1900s, that Thomas Mudge invention was, was used. That's how significant that was. Um, when, when George Daniels died, he had completed 24 of the most extraordinary technically advanced watches ever made. Believe it or not, these mechanical watches are more accurate than the most accurate court watch ever developed. Uh, some, only, some lose less than a second per month. And these are mechanical watches. This is just an unbelievable um, a piece of technology that, that uh, it, it, as far as I'm concerned, it's, 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 it is unbelievable how, how a mechanical piece can, can keep more accurate time, timing than a quartz piece. It's incredible. Um, Swatch Group got their hands on this. And like I said, in the, uh, I started using it with the, with the Omega brand. And there's a whole couple different lines of Omega watches out there that specifically use the coaxial. A couple of what, what happened was after George Daniels died, his daughter sold a bunch of his, uh, well, like they only made 24 of them, but it took about a year for each watch to be made by hand. And his daughter sold a bunch, or most of these uh, in auction. And here's three of them that I was able to trace back. They sold the grand complication on the left. That sold for 1 million three in 2012. Uh, the 18, the, this 18 carat a chronometer and pocket watch with a turbulent mechanism sold for more than a half a million. And then the, the 18 carat four minute turbulent over here on the right with a coaxial statement that sold for almost 600,000 in 2012. And I would say that if they came to auction today, eight, nine years later, they would significantly increase in value because there's nothing else like them in the world. So that kind of does it um, for part one. I wanted to keep this to a uh, um, half an hour or so. So if anybody would have any, any questions or, or comments on it, um, they can either, you can either put them on the uh, um, chat board or, or just speak up. I think most of you are unmuted now. Can you hear me, David? Yeah. I'm David. Yeah. Um, we can't see you though. I, we can't so see Dave, you. Dave doesn't have a uh, camera, I don't think. Yes, I do. Why is it not on? Do I have to? Uh, what do I have? On. What I up your name? Yeah. You have to turn okay. it on. No, in the beginning, Pete saw me, and I saw Pete. I didn't touch mm -hmm. anything since then. Okay, that's okay. We can still hear you, Dave. Go ahead. You want to see yeah, I, was in, I was in Brazil uh, shortly after Omega launched uh, uh, the the Daniel's chronometer, and I was in a I was in a uh, doctor's office. I was looking through a magazine and came upon it, and I I instantly went crazy. So I uh, did a a bad thing. I ripped out the page of the of the magazine, and I took it with me. And when I got home, uh, I got on the computer with some people in Boston in the jewelers building and said, can you can can I buy one of these watches from you? And it didn't work very well. So I remembered that downtown Salvador, I was living in uh, Bahia at that time, uh, downtown, downtown Salvador in the uh, largest shopping mall up on the top floor, you went around a corner. And there was a store by the name of uh, Dezoito Kilachis, 18 carats. And I always used to remember because they had high-grade watches in the display case. So I went in and I showed the woman uh, sales lady. And, you know, it's it's much different than here. I went in and she immediately got me a, a demi tasse cup of coffee and I sat down and I showed her the picture, and I said, "I said, do you have any of these watches?" She said, "No, but uh, let me look into it." And I gave her my telephone number. She called me. She said, "She said, yes, I have uh, found the watch 
There is only one in the country. It's in Curitiba, which is in the south of Brazil, and I have convinced <clears throat> the owner to bring it here. And when it's when it comes in, I'll 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 call you. And so <laughs> she called me. I went in. She offered. She had it in front of me. I went completely crazy when I opened the box and looked at this piece. And she offered it, and I said, "Well, that's a little bit too high." Blah blah blah. Not too much bargaining, and I bought the watch. And I still have that watch today. And through the help of Pete, uh, he put me in touch with a man in uh, an Atlanta area who, because I was concerned in that I had never had it serviced. And he pointed out two things. One was never put a uh, self-winding watch on an automatic winder, particularly this one, because it will only wear uh, uh, in, a, in an adverse condition. He also he also said that if you do ever go to have it service, go directly to Omega. And he, but he also said you really don't have to have it serviced. I have not used it that much. It has an up-down indicator on it. It's absolutely magnificent piece. Yeah. yeah, I think most of them are, aren't they, aren't they non, they're, they're like all self-lubricated, I believe, too, right? You don't even need to oil them. No, no, yeah, that's what, it, that's what I was told. Yeah, so it's an incredible. And was, and this, is, this is back just a year or two after they were launched. And so uh, my son this year uh, became... 50 years old, and I was able to find one on eBay and give it to him as a as a birthday present. I thought that was cool. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Uh, my, my birthday is coming up. <laughs> I, <Yeah>. I, <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget. I have a I have a couple of clunkers in the drawer. I might consider. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So up in the screen All right, there. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Up in the screen there, those are the 11 people we talked about today. Uh, anybody have any comments or questions about any of those uh, important historical figures? Do you have any idea when you're going to put this up on the on YouTube? Um, probably for the next day or two. I'll just have to All cut right. out a bunch of stuff. You know, I got I have software I can. Um, I'll bring I'll bring the video into software, and then I'll cut out the beginning of it and put a put an entrance or something on it. But it shouldn't take long. All right, the, 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 that there's a lot of information that to disseminate to to kind of little look into yeah. and uh, uh, read so, all that stuff. Very interesting though. Yeah, the next the next group of people we'll talk about are these right here and. Um, <clears throat> Uh, some of these people are are just absolutely incredible, like like Thomas Mudge. Uh, we we all heard of Simon Willard and Seth Thomas, Louis Cartier. John Harwood was the person that invented the self winding automatic wristwatch. Um, George Graham, a very important uh, inventor and physicist and whatnot. So some of these people are just absolutely incredible. So like I said earlier, it wasn't fair that we that I didn't include them, but to include 22 people in one program is just too long. 